Okay, now for some intervention plan and goals regarding Frank. So first, some of the assessments that we can use to evaluate Frank's uh, lower extremity and upper extremity. It's going to be the functional test for hemiplegic and paretic upper extremity. So this is a standardized test. It has uh, about 17 tasks divided into seven functional levels. It follows and reflects Brunstrom hierarchy of motor recovery in hemiplegia with valid scores strongly correlated with Fugelmeyer assessment of motor function. One disadvantage is it does not provide a specific reason why a patient failed the test. Another one is the arm motor ability test. It uses functional tasks with excellent reliability and validity. It includes 13 unilateral and bilateral functional tasks scored on performance time, functional ability, and quality of movement. And then another one is the Wolf Motor Function Test. It has a combination of simple and complex movement and has excellent inter-rater and test-retest reliability. It includes about 17 tasks measuring strength, sequence, sequence according to joints involved and level of difficulty, timed upper extremity movements, and functional tasks. So some of Frank's long-term goals are going to be that within three weeks, the patient will be able to perform upper body bathing while sitting unsupported at the sink with minimum assistance. Another one is within three weeks, the patient will be men assist in upper body dressing. Now his short-term goals directly for the upper body bathing will be that the patient will bathe upper body supported at sink and attend left side of body with moderate assistance within two weeks. Another goal, uh, short term goal for upper body bathing is the patient will attend to task on left with two or less cues in order. Frank's short term goals for upper body dressing it's going to be patient will don pullover shirt with minimal assistance while seated with minimal trunk support within two weeks. Another one is that the patient will demonstrate fair supported sitting balance during dressing with moderate trunk and moderate assistance with two verbal cues within one week. Now when we're dealing with the goal, sometimes you can, the client and their um, wife, in this instance Frank and his wife, can have some unrealistic long-term goals. And some ways to be able to deal with that is first you want to educate. And so you can educate and inform the client um, and his wife. And you want to do this in a constructive, straightforward, honest, and comfortable manner. And you also want to utilize your therapeutic modes and intentional relationships. And just remember, with different perceptions, therapy expectations should be discussed with the client and his wife, and you want to start this towards the beginning of treatment. So just some potential obstacles that for the goal completion that can come up. Um, can his caregiver buy in? Simply with his wife and him possibly having some unrealistic uh, views of what they expect uh, Frank to be able to return to or be able to be capable of. Also increased deficits due to his comorbidities. He also has diabetes and um, some coronary artery disease. As well as with uh, depression and awareness deficits have an inverse relationship. Therefore, as his awareness becomes more intact, his depression may increase. Or if he doesn't have awareness, then he's not going to have depression, but he's not aware of his deficit. So these two things have a relationship that kind of counteract each other. Now, with being an OT, we also have the wonderful assistance of our CODAs, and some of their assets to the plan of care include, during the evaluation process, the OT may allow a CODA to only collect data for assessments. The OT is still responsible for the accuracy of the data. Um, also, during the intervention planning, the OT and CODA can work jointly to revise short-term goals, but the OT has the last say in determining them. During the intervention sessions, the CODA can be delegated tasks only if they both agree it's when the competence level of the CODA. And for discharge, only OTs are allowed to discharge the client. Um, so with 
we talked about assessments a little bit earlier, but we're going to circle back and just go over some different assessments based off the area that we're addressing. So some for self-care can be the Barthel Index and as well as the FEM. This one was done, the Barthel Index was done recently. It should be used again in reevaluating the patient. So in our case study, Frank actually did uh, receive the Barthel Index uh, evaluation. And so this is something that you want to reassess for changes. And so the reason for usage is it helps determine their progression in therapy and the need for further evaluation or changes in intervention. And then with the FEM, it helps determine a patient's discharge status. Some other assessments for ADLs is the A1 as well as the AMPS. And these address different areas. So the reason for the A1 is it helps determine the patient's disabilities when it comes to specific components, such as like apraxia, um, functional ambulation, and severity of neurobehavioral components. And then the AMPS, the reason for usage would be it helps determine the patient's independence in doing ADLs and IADLs, whether they are efficient and safe in doing them. And then for IADL assessment that you can use is the Milwaukee Evaluation of Daily Living Skills. The reason for using this one is it helps determine PT, uh, the patient's status for discharge, if they are able to manage on their own, or if, they, if there are any other components that need to be included in therapy. And then for assessing performance skills and client factors, you can use the Jepson taylor Hand Function Test. This one helps determine the patient's progress in upper extremity function and coordination. So now just to go through some different scenarios and situations. So Frank has regained active range of motion of 15 degrees in all motions of his upper extremity. How would the intervention plan be modified? How would this affect <clears throat> his ability to use upper extremity functionally during ADLs and other activities? So the intervention plan can be adjusted encouraging Frank to use his regained range of motion during his therapeutic activities. The more Frank moves within his available active range of motion, the closer he will be to reaching within functional limits in all motions of his left upper extremity. Another uh, scenario is you walk into Frank's room in the morning to work with him on ADLs and find him in bed with the bed rails up, but trying to climb over them. He already has one leg over the bed rail and is trying to get his left leg over now. What would you do and why? First, we're going to help the patient get back to their bed safely and ask for their intentions. Second, we would, uh, after getting the patient back to bed, uh, we, would ask, uh, we would inform him on safety precautions and regulations of staying in the rehab hospital. We will discuss with him other options and procedures that he can do when he needs to get out of bed or needs further assistance in order to follow safety precautions. We would also let the nurse um, know about this and document it as well that the, for patient care regarding situations that just occurred. Next, during an intervention session in the OT kitchen, Frank is making a cup of instant coffee. He turns on the stove, gets the kettle, and takes it to the sink to fill. He starts the water and then notices a sponge and starts to clean up the area around the sink the sink itself, and the outside of the cabinets in the, around the sink. He has forgotten the stove and the kettle and has left the water running for five minutes during his cleaning. What do you think is the cause of this behavior, and how would you refocus, Frank? What, uh, would you adjust future kitchen activities, and if so, how? So the cause is going to be his decrease in attention span, particularly uh, sustained attention and also dealing a little bit with alternating attention as well. So sustained affects his ability to focus on one task for a long period of time and then alternating to be able to deal with one task uh, and then go move to another task and return back to the first one. So to refocus the patient, um, I would use verbal cues using prompting questions. So you want to ask them, hey, did we forget anything? What were we doing? you know, help orient the patient to what did we originally come into the kitchen for, what was our steps, and then you want to move to direct and tactile cue and gift needed so you can actually walk to the stove, you can touch it, like 
what should we be doing here, different things like that. Just increase the, the queuing as needed. Also for future kitchen activities, um, you can replace using the stove with a coffee maker or microwave and because they can help give an auditory cue to regain the patient's attention once the food or beverage items are complete. Another scenario is Frank is in the middle of dressing himself. He has been following a set of cards with the steps of dressing on them with good results. Today, Frank is not attending the cards. He starts to get up, leave the room, but only has his boxers on. How would you redirect Frank to his dressing task? So again, we're going to start with verbal cues. Frank, are you beginning to put something on? Um, and helps him kind of become aware of his missing clothing items. And then you can move to uh, redirecting him with the cards so the therapist can look over to the cards or the clothing items. The therapist can point to the cards. If that doesn't work, then we can move to gestures. Uh, if gestures aren't effective, then we can move to verbal assistance. So get your cards with the steps for dressing. Find your cards. Uh, lastly, we can move to physical assistance if he still cannot redirect himself. Get his cards for dressing and gather the clothing for him and hold his pants as he's putting them on. Another one is during functional mobility. Frank has progressed to ambulating with the hemi walker and supervision. However, he bumps into objects on the left side, the door frame, the bed, the dresser. How would you address this during intervention sessions? So first, we would address this by teaching compensatory strategies and practicing extremity protection. We're going to promote safety by teaching scanning techniques, using their unaffected side to help guide their body awareness. And then frequent cueing and repetition can also be implemented with navigating around the rehab hospital and his room during therapy. Now discharge planning. So Frank is being discharged home. He now requires supervision for dressing and bathing, using his cue cards and equipment. He continues to be impulsive and has poor insight into his deficits. And the carryover of new learning requires frequent repetitions. He can use his left upper extremity to stabilize objects, but gross and fine motor coordination are still poor. He continues to have left neglect and has difficulty compensating for it. What services would you recommend for Frank and why? One of the main services um, that we're going to recommend for Frank is home health occupational therapy service for cognition and perception, gross and fine motor coordination, as well as ADL and IDL tra a training. And then I also think that Frank needs an aid for safety and supervision. OT uh, referral to home health agency. So uh, the referral to the home health agency would be something similar to re referral to home health care to continue OT for musculoskeletal, cognitive, and perceptual deficits. And then we want to discharge with instructions for the caregiver. So fall risk and prevention, uh, handouts, and well as training, recommendations for necessary home alterations or adaptive equipment, facilitate continued preparatory exercises, Facilitate frequent repetitions of home programs for self-care, ADL, IADL, and leisure routines. Continue to facilitate compensatory strategies and extremity protection when navigating in-home environment. And then provide sources for information, assistance, and community support groups.